Horology. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the urban gentry. Its continuing mission to explore strange new watches. To seek out cool vintage pieces with pure class. To boldly go where no watch channel has gone before. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, we are gonna look at some very cool watches indeed. And uh, now this video comes about basically a bit of a sequel. If you guys remember, I think it was last year. Uh, I do apologize, uh, my memory fails me, but I did a video looking at, I think five or six, possibly seven, uh, mainly mechanical pieces under $500 that would double in value. Well, today I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could find some pieces under $200 uh, that will double, possibly even triple in value. And I, I think I've succeeded. Looking back at my first video, the video is, a uh, link is in the description. Uh, pretty much all of my predictions uh, were correct. Uh, so I'm pleased about that. So I'm, I'm trying to see if I could, you know, um, find some bargains under $200. That is the challenge today. Now, before we get into this particular video, I must state very clearly that I do not buy watches for investment. I buy watches for enjoyment, for fun. Um, and also it's a great way to learn about watches, especially as I think this video will highlight, there are some real sweet spots in the used market, especially as digital watches become vintage now. Watches do not have to be mechanical, they don't have to be high-end, they don't have to be luxury to increase in value or to be fun. But mainly I think it's the thrill, the hunt, you know, that, that I enjoy so much. So, uh, and now of course I've got to do wristwatch check before I uh, change perspectives. I'm wearing my Zin 104 on a beautiful new uh, one-piece leather strap from Colorep. This is entirely handmade in Italy. No two straps are the same. It has that beautiful distressed, dark, uh, luscious brown on the outside. And on the inside, it's a beautiful supple. I mean, it's so soft, you want to eat it. Color Red with the best luxury straps. Their quality is second to none, in my opinion. And I, I gotta admit though, I'm not a big into the leather one piece. Uh, however, this has converted me because it's so thin and slender, it, it's not so bulky, so it just wears magnificently. And, I, and guys, I think for the Zin 104, a great match, a great combination, a killer combo there. Anyway, guys, before I wrap it on about my beloved Zin 104, wristwatch check done, let's change perspectives and have a closer look at these five super cool watches I recently picked up. So the first watch we're gonna look at today is this rather peculiar looking, quite unassuming digital watch from Casio. Now I snagged this for a measly 30 bucks. So the reference is the Casio AQX11 and it houses the module, I believe it might be written on the back. There you go, there's the module, the 1358. So you're probably wondering, well, that's not digital, that's analog. And you're right, it does have analog hands there. However, you press the uh, top right button and what happens is that you get an overlay and this is called the Twincept. This is actually a proprietary technology that Casio pioneered. And this watch is from the 90s, um, the late 80s, early 90s. It's in a very small size. Let's just actually, let's get a mess, um, little measurement. It's only 36 millimeter. Unfortunately, the original strap had deteriorated. So I've put it on this Bonetto Cinturini vanilla scented uh, rubber strap, which I think kind of echoes the retro styling quite nicely. So this is a fascinating little watch because this is actually a forgotten evolutionary step in Casio's history. Casio really were pioneering 
um, digital watches. Well, they always have. And there was a, an increasing trend for any digital watches, especially towards the late 80s, early 90s. And the twin set was born. It's been forgotten about a little bit. It really has a nice clean design with minute indications on the outside. And as you scroll through, uh, you press this button here, it, you have an alarm, you have uh, a jewel time. The stopwatch is actually running, sorry, I forgot to reset it. And you press the button again and it disappears, it's analog again. So very, very cool. So this is one of the first attempts at Casio of overlaying a digital display on top of analog and they've done it seamlessly well now unfortunately a lot of these twin set watches the digital um, part deteriorates and can fade and if you see at some angles it's it's not as clear see there it's not as clear and um, this is you know some of the the early teething problems of of the twin set watches but this is a fantastic example because it still beeps nicely um, and has a, a great amount of uh, versatility. Uh, it's extremely light, and I believe the water resistance is 100 meters as well. So a little cool part of History Forgotten. It has a slightly futuristic, modernist aesthetic. Reminds me a little bit of Robocop. I have no idea why it just does. Uh, you've got to remember at the time, this was quite cutting edge. This watch really demonstrates something, an important point, and that is that it doesn't have to be mechanical to be horologically significant. This is a part of the evolution of digital watches, and for a measly 30 bucks, great to find it in such uh, amazing condition. Wonderful, really cool. I love that little dash of, of red. It has a slight kind of tactical look about it, uh, but it functions very, very well. This is a really pristine example of the watch. Shame about the strap, but I think um, you could really have some fun with different rubber straps. Um, so a forgotten part of Casio's innovative history making digital watches. So we had to have another Swatch watch in here, and this is a very peculiar Swatch watch indeed. This is called the Wheel Animal. As you can tell by the design, it's... Uh, very abstract, and it was actually made to commemorate the 700 year anniversary of the Swiss Confederation. And you can see on the back, it's actually the second edition, limited to 5,555 pieces. Well, for a plastic quartz watch, that is actually uh, quite a low amount, even for Swatch. And as you can see there, Swiss made. It's the standard. Uh, swatch we've all come uh, to know and love. However, there's a big difference as that little stamped NV indicates this design was made in collaboration with the Swiss born artist Not Vital. Now Not Vital is quite a fascinating figure. I couldn't find out too much about him. Even the Wikipedia page was in German. Um, however, I am a little bit familiar with his work. Uh, he mainly does extremely abstract, minimalist sculptures mainly, although uh, he, he does experiment with all different kind of types of media. So this is from 1991. And the wheel is, as you can see, it's three-dimensional. The wheel has what I can only describe as a, it, it looks almost like a little tree at the top. And that is how you read the time. It moves incredibly slowly. If I pull out the crown and rotate it, you can see it. So it only gives a vague idea of what the time is because of its rarity and its significance, marking a special occasion, and not to mention its relatively low amount, well, for plastic quartz. The fact that the artist was directly responsible for the design increases its desirability. This is certainly a rarity. The wheel, has the cross in it, as we all know, the, the, the Swiss flag having a cross in it. It's totally up to your interpretation, very abstract, certainly an acquired taste, but I snagged this little thing for I think about 40 bucks. Uh, collectors will be all over it. Unfortunately, it didn't have the original box, but it, because it is in remarkably good condition and it is a direct collaboration that the, the, the artist designed it himself, it's certainly going to be worth something. Whether it'll double or triple, who knows? Um, I think for the price I paid, 
uh, it certainly has a good chance of doing that. So this is the typical 34 millimeter size we know from the early 90s. Nowadays they're more 42 millimeter size. I must admit I do like that wheel, the fact that it's a little bit uneven and it's so bizarre and different. Um, gives a more relaxed interpretation of timekeeping, uh, almost the kind of ancient way of timekeeping. You don't see it move whatsoever. Uh, it reminds me of a kind of, um, it actually it reminds me of Stonehenge a little bit. It has that early man feel about it. Um, and it gives the impression that it's iron uh, or, or made of a metal. Um, again, it looks like something that was dug up from the Iron Age. I love the juxtaposition of kind of wonky old ancient and ultra modern plastic you know ultra consumerism uh, meets uh, a very kind of high end high art it's it's um utterly bizarre but yet quite lovable and guys if you want to uh, learn more about swatch and collecting swatches i do highly recommend this book it's swatch a guide for connoisseurs and collectors okay moving on to something completely different and here we have a very snazzy little seiko this is the seiko 8 m256009 it's from the age of discovery line which was a series of watches from the very very late 80s into the first few years of the 90s this one i think is from 1991 there was a wonderful range of, of watches inspired by as the aesthetic suggests kind of marine chronometers and the name also suggests the age of discovery there is some really cool little throwback uh, elements to its design. There was even a perpetual calendar, there was a world timer, there was a date, simple date version, and even a moon phase. And they were all quartz watches, so super duper thin. They were all gold uh, plated, which as this is, with a stainless steel case back. And what is interesting with these slightly more luxurious higher end Seikos, because uh, let's not forget, this is the tail end of the 80s, the loads of money uh, Wall Street generation. Even the straps. Do you remember how I always criticize Seiko straps for being badly made? Well, this is a beautifully made strap. And as you see, they're made in Austria. Padded in the center, incredible stitching, a little bit torn up here. But I managed to track this one down on the used market for under, I think just, I think it was about 150 I had to order it from Israel. Uh, shout out to my uh, Israeli fans and viewers. So really quite incredible because usually you see the gold plating is faded. Now gold plating back in the day was a little bit thicker, so not so bad. Unfortunately today they've got very economical with their gold plating. Now what is captivating about this watch? Although it's a smaller 34 millimeter size, 36 thereabouts, you don't actually use the crown to set the time. You use the crown to manipulate this almost looks like a sextant again keeping with that nautical uh colonial era styling and you rotate the crown and you flick through all the different uh settings and as you can see the hands are now moving so you have alarm uh, the alarm setting, you have a timer, which is a countdown, chronograph, and of course the main time. If we go to the chronograph, it'll set to the 12, and then you use the pushers to start the timing, and it has a 16-minute chronograph. Very, very cool, and you can see a little bit of a organic style, organic, sorry, and you see a little bit of a, a automatic style sweep to it, so it's a it's a mecha quartz, and there you go, very cool indeed. I love the gothic style Roman numerals, uh, the one at 12 in red. A little nod to the original first wristwatch Seiko ever did, which was the laurel. A recurring theme in Seiko's design, they always pay tribute to that first laurel watch. But I love this, it's, it's even got little applied gold dots. The three there, the one. Um, I love the texture of the dial. It has this lovely kind of brushed, slightly more subdued gold tone, and then the framing it with this almost cream-colored uh, ring, and then we have a very subtle minute and 
second strap on the outside. I love the case as well. It has almost a Doric column style um, little step there. In a way, it suggests pocket watches, but again, you know, pocket watches didn't really exist back then. And of course, these stunning poire hands, um, very subtle in the minute hands. Let's just stop the chronograph a minute and then reset it. And reset let's let's go to the time so very useful features and it's incredibly thin actually what is the uh, precise me measurements on this wow seven millimeters beautifully thin so uh and lug to lug we got 37 what's the lug width yeah 34 great size and i just love the strap i never thought i would love a seiko strap as much as this makes a wonderful dress watch because it's so classic. I mean, there's there's little elements of kind of breguet. There's definitely, dare I say it, it reminds me of Harrison's chronometers in, in, in a certain, uh, to a certain degree. Now inside is the um, Seiko Caliber 8M25. Uh, it has a two and a half year battery life, even if you run the chronograph for five minutes a day, which is quite impressive. And of course, the accuracy you all come to expect with the quartz movement. Now, as you can see, the condition of this is excellent considering its age. You'll see them from 500 all the way up to 1,000, depending on which version. The perpetual calendars, obviously, uh, are a lot more complicated. They have a stunning array of hands. I mean, Seiko just absolutely knocked it out of the park with this line of watches. Very classy. I mean, it really does exude the sophistication of, let's say, 18th century uh, watches and clocks. This particular deal I snagged from Israel, the guy even had the original box. And look at the box. It's, even the box is gold and a little bit more luxurious. Um, so really, really cool. I don't typically buy it from overseas in rare cases. Um, I think it's the second time I bought a watch from Israel and uh, the guy really knew what he was doing. It came beautifully wrapped and uh, yeah, you can see there's a lot of wear on the back, but still got a lot of life. And I feel actually it's aged patinaed look adds to it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful watch. No wonder the quartz crisis happened. Uh, I, and this just demonstrates the, the hidden gems you always find with uh, Seiko. Okay, so the next watch, uh, which I have shared before, is my little citizen, uh, Windsurfer. This is a very peculiar retro looking watch from 1990, um, so the tail end of the 80s. And as you can see from all the markings, it is a nautical racing watch with a bi-directional bezel to do um, various calculations and wind speed and all the rest of it. There's even a little conversion chart there. Now, it came on a rubber strap. Unfortunately, the rubber strap was not the original. Um, I am going to buy a new rubber strap. I'm trying to locate, you can still buy parts for this, funnily enough. Now, the reason I bought it was because the main head of the watch is in absolutely pristine condition. It has a very, very retro, almost back to the future style. She does remind me a little bit of the um, DeLorean car. It even has a backlight, which is very cool. Let's scroll through the features. So the top display is all the features. So it has two timers, main time, alarm, uh, and the stopwatch. Now the stopwatch, I believe, is... Let's reset it. As you can hear, the beep is still working. So if I start the chronograph, uh, and it's nice that, that the start and stop is in red, we have four pushes. If I start it, it has a graph here. Red for seconds, the first 10 seconds. Then we have, I think it's 10 seconds, no. Perhaps it's five seconds, yeah, I think it's five. And then it starts counting down the opposite direction, so it's inverted. Very, very cool. I love that. I don't know, it takes me back to childhood, it really does. It's a 40 millimeter in diameter. I believe it's about a centimeter tall. It's astonishing condition. I think it's been in a drawer somewhere. And even to such an extent, if I just remove the NATO strap, see on the back, it still has the Casio sticker on it. I mean, incredible. Very cool, very cool. Uh, I believe the module is, as the name suggests, so it's the D120312 
1.589. And this is from the Citizen Promaster uh, line. It's 100 meters water resistant, so it was really built for nautical kind of adventures and, and, and uh, racing. And as you can see, yeah, we get a nice solid beat. That's something that vintage digital watches, you know, you have to look out for. Uh, if you remember the Arnie, I tracked down uh, the, the, sometimes the uh, beep with the little uh, speaker that they have inside is the first thing to go. Now there was various versions of this watch with various complications. There's one with a compass in the um, bi-directional uh, bezel. Um, just very lovable. Believe it or not, I've seen these go for as much as a thousand dollars. Unfortunately, didn't have the, the box and the strap, but um, the strap actually has even more conversion charts on this p section. Definitely an acquired taste. And this is a perfect example of one of those strange citizens that uh, is forgotten about. The Promaster moved on from nautical racing watches uh, into other things. So let's move on to the star of the show. Yes, it's a Star Trek watch from Timex. <laughs> this, believe it or not, is called the Make It So watch. It's a bit difficult to see there because it is very scratched up. But it is the original horribly made leather strap. This is just a cheap Chinese thing. Um, but you can see the Star Trek insignia there of the, uh, of the Federation. And this is actually an officially licensed product. It, it even says on the back, trademark 1993. So this is a mystery dial. We have the seconds as a spinning disc that's uh, see-through. Uh, and the actual Starship Enterprise, this is from the next generation, obviously. And now I, I must confess, I am a bit of a Trekkie. I'm not uh, hugely obsessed with it to the point I'm going to you know, speak Klingon, but I do... My, actually, I have a real soft spot for Deep Space Nine in particular. I think Guldercut, uh, the character Guldercut, is one of the most beautifully written and carefully nuanced villains ever committed to um, television uh, it's just incredible I, I, I love the whole show I there's something about it uh, it's definitely my favorite although this is obviously for the next generation and you can see this the enterprise uh, hurtling through in a rather staggered <laughs> manner I don't think their warp drive has uh, is functioning properly and I love how it disappears behind this particular um, maybe it's a planet who knows and there's various levels there are hour markers indicated by those stars not all the way around but very very cool just a rudimentary basic quartz movement these were very affordable I mean you know these these were cheap as chips back in the day I picked this up for about I think I think it was about 40 bucks. Um, you'll see them on eBay for 100, even more. It's undoubtedly gonna increase in value because it is officially licensed. Um, and it's a real Star Trek watch. Now the diameter, 39 millimeter size, 11 millimeters thick. We have this stunning domed acrylic uh, that is in remarkably good condition considering the rest is a bit worn. Now Timex have a long tradition of making um, watches in association with kind of pop culture TV shows. The original Mickey Mouse watch which was officially licensed from or by Walt Disney back in the 30s became incredibly popular. In fact, to such an extent that they were the first timepiece that sold over a million pieces. And it actually saved the company from financial disaster because this was during the depression era. Um, so it really is a bit of a forgotten icon. So Timex's involvement with making pop culture watches uh, is quite long. So yeah, this watch is a, almost kind of kitsch, you could say, there's not that much quality watchmaking or craftsmanship going on here. However, because it's an officially licensed product, because it's Timex, because there are collectors of this thing, you, you, we all know Trekkies are <laughs> will, will pay top dollar for this. And actually, I got to admit, it's it's not terribly done. It's it's kind of cool, you know, in a really nerdy way. I love that smooth bezel well, as well. It's it could have been so ghastly. So anyway, that's it, guys. Five watches, all costing under two hundred dollars. Um, that I, f I think will increase in value. Um, some of them are collector's pieces. Some of them are just, you know, missing links in horological history. So I think it really demonstrates a watch doesn't have to be mechanical. 
uh, uh, to to be collectible or go up in value. It doesn't have to be high end, and it can even be digital or just uh, affordable cheap quartz. Um, so a lot of fun timepieces here. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions. Uh, also, any suggestions of watches you feel uh, will double or triple even in value under $200. I'd love to hear your opinions down below in the comments. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.